Uh, it is called the perfect storm. Uh, most of it will be taken from Mark. Uh, you can look at the, uh, the outline there. I, it's not really an outline. My main purpose of this whole sermon is to draw our attention to weak faith uh, and the trials that we sometimes have to be taken through so our faith, faith will increase and when we come out on the other side we will realize these things. But in all of those trials, it requires a commitment, a steadfast commitment that we go to him, that we worship him. Whatever is in our path, we must keep walking forward. We must not veer away from Christ. We must not die. It does not matter. All right. I want to ask you a question. Do any of you remember the Andrea Gale? Have you ever heard of that term before, the name of that ship? In October of 1991, in October, it was a Halloween, that ship went down. They lost six people plus the captain. And his name was Billy Tyne. He did not heed the warnings that were given to him about the immensity of this storm that was gathering. And he, in his own self-assurances, decided to stay and to fish. And so he got caught in the storm, and the ship went down. But the ship that the believers of Jesus Christ are on board on, it, it is a great ship, and it should be christened the Savior's ship, eternal. And we're going to talk about the perfect storm that it encountered on that afternoon in Galilee. None were lost on that ship. Its home port was Capernaum. They were sailing to the land of the Gerasenes. Christ was on a mission of mercy. Just like the mission of mercy and grace that was granted to you on a hill far away a long time ago. The scripture today will be from Mark, the fourth chapter, concentrating most of our attention to verses 35 and 40. Verse 40 were words of rebuke of Christ. And I pray that he will never ask me that question that he asked those disciples that day. No matter how high and how towering the waves are above my small craft. So he was sailing for, from Capernaum. Our Savior went to Capernaum after he was expelled from Nazareth. Now when Jesus heard, this is Matthew 4, 13 and 16. Now when Jesus heard that John had been taken into custody, he withdrew into Galilee and leaving Nazareth, he came and settled in Capernaum, which is by the sea in the region, region of Zebulun and Naphtali. This was to fill fulfill what was spoken through Isaiah the prophet. The land of Zebulun and the land of Naphtali by the way of the sea beyond the Jordan, Galilee of the Gentiles. Now those people were sitting in darkness. They saw a great light. And those who were sitting in the land and shadow of death, upon them a light dawned. That should awaken every person that's been given belief in the Lord Jesus Christ, that a great light has shined upon them, and they were sitting in death. Capernaum was a scene of many of Christ's miracles, and many incidences of his life took place there, but it had no effect on that city. 
And we can deduce from that beings, Capernaum went down under the curse of Christ that Christ had not allowed their ears to be opened to hear the word of truth. And so he, they did not repent even after all they saw. And that is a sure sign that miracles and signs do not draw anyone to Christ. It is only by the call of God to his son, Jesus Christ. There is no other call that is effectual except the call of God. And so in Matthew eleven twenty three, he said to those in Capernaum, he said, and you Capernaum will not be exalted to heaven, will you? You will descend to Hades. For if the miracles had occurred in Sodom, which it occurred in you, it would be remaining this day. Now, Capernaum is just a pile of rubble about two miles southwest of the Lake of Galilee. It's called um, Tel Hum, I believe is the name of it, but we're, we're not concentrating on that. Now, when sudden storms arise, and I would imagine that just about everybody in this room have had storms crop up in their life, who do you seek? Is the Christ the one you plead to? You should be in communication with Christ at all times. It is Christ who is the author and perfecter of your faith. Do you understand that? What a gift. What? Yeah, faith. That is our victory. Our faith that was given to us by Jesus Christ. He is the archegon, the one who causes something to begin. The originator, the founder, the initiator. He is Italian, the finisher, the one who brings faith to its highest attainment. Reminded of a song. Old soul, are you wearied and troubled? No light in the darkness do you see. Turn your eyes upon Jesus. Look full in his wonderful face. And the things of earth will grow strangely dim in the light of his glory and grace. Do not shut your communication off with Christ. Do not shut that transponder off like the captain of the Andrew Gale did. He could have been rescued. What does the word, the eternal truth, say of our Lord, the one who is at the helm of our ship? How does it describe him? Is it as the paintings that we see in the walls of the churches, a handsome man with a beard, no, that is completely contradictory to all that the scriptures teach us. For he grew up before him like a tender shoot. And like a root out of parched ground, he has no stately form or majesty that we should look upon him, nor appearance that we should be attracted to him. He was despised and forsaken of men, a man of sorrow and acquainted with grief, and like one from whom men hid their faces. He was despised, and we did not esteem him. Surely our grief he himself bore, and our sorrows he carried, Yet we ourselves esteemed him not. They thought he was stricken, that he was smitten of God and afflicted. But he was pierced through for our transgressions, our chastening for our well-being fell upon him. And by his scourging, we are healed. And I am afraid 
that there are many, many, many that are going to churches that don't esteem him. They go out on the Lake of Galilee in the midst of a storm without the protection of Jesus Christ. Why is that? They neglect to worship him. They neglect the gathering together. He is the perfect teacher. He was in a boat speaking to the crowd on the shore. And in Mark, the fourth chapter, the 33rd through the 35th verse, with many such parables, he was speaking the word to them so far as they were able to hear it. As far as they were able to hear it. Some of their ears were not opened. They couldn't understand it. He did not speak to them without a parable, but he was explaining everything privately to his own disciples. He expounded the word to them. He cracked that nut of the word open and he revealed the meat that was in the shell. What really interested me in their Jesus Christ was explaining privately to his disciples. Are you a disciple of Jesus Christ? Is his spirit moving in your heart? Is that revelation for the word dawning on you? When you look at something in scripture, oh my word, I never realized that before. Tony is in love with Ephesians, the first chapter, the fourth verse, right? And what does it say? We were chosen in him before the foundation of the world to be holy and blameless before him. Well, if you were chosen to be holy and blameless before him, before the foundation of the world, your birth was also designated. I was predestined to come from the womb of my mother, as all of you are, because God has an eternal plan for us. And why do some people shun it? Like, why did I for 40 years? As far as I was able to understand it. He cracked the nut. He explained the word to him. On that day when evening came, he said to them, let us go over to the other side. Then leaving the crowd, they took him along with them in the boat just as he was, and other boats were with him. And there arose a fierce gale of wind, and the waves were breaking over the boat so much that the boat was already filling up. Mark 4, 36 and 37. Verse 38 of Mark 4th chapter. It says that Jesus himself was asleep in the stern of the boat on a cushion. You see, Jesus was at peace. His hour had not yet come. He had things to do. And they woke him and said to him, Teacher, do you not care that we are perishing? The word teacher is a Greek word, didaskala. It means great one. It means master. The question they asked him was an imperfect question to a perfect Savior. And what do I mean by that? Their faith was small. This was evidently a very concerned, and it was a question that came out of them being terrified. The disciples made it to the question that the disciples asked of Christ that time. It was a very intriguing question to me. And why do I say that? Because they had witnessed all the miracles. They had witnessed him feeding the 5,000. And why would they then say to him, do you not care that we are perishing? And we with hindsight 
we without having the word tell us that Jesus Christ mounted that cross for us to secure our eternal life we're blessed how could they think that he did not care maybe it was because they had not yet seen his hour on the cross they had not seen his crucifixion they had not seen his resurrection now I disdain putting words in anyone's mouth for scripture tells us who knows the thoughts of a man except the spirit of the man that is in him if you and I were in that storm on that ship on that day and it was evident from the towering waves around us and the wind that was blowing from all direction and we looked and we saw our master asleep on the stern of the boat mm -hmm. we would wonder don't you care that we're perishing and I said we probably would no I am sure we would not a doubt in my mind that we would have coursed right in with all those disciples that day. And why do I say that? Everyone in this room's life is pre-regeneration and then we also have post-regeneration. And it is the post-regeneration that is wonderful because the things of God are enlightened to us. We understand what he has in plan for us. There is a course that says, with Christ in the vessel, we can go sailing home. There is an unspoken but often demonstrated assuredness in the life of steadfast believers. Their faith is strong. Their faith was given to them, but they have built on that faith. Their faith is increased. How? If I were to ask you, how is your faith increased? Can you give me an answer? Surely you know by hearing the word. Steadfast faith only comes by a steady, a habitual, and concentrated discipleship. It does not end when we walk out that door on a Sunday afternoon or a Wednesday evening. It comes every day when in the private of your closet you speak to the Lord and you open the book in front of you. It is that time when revelation may fall upon you. From faith increasing comes the knowledge that Christ is at the helm. And that he is there to help and to sustain us. He is in our vessel as we sail home together. He is in our life. We see his hand in our successes and our failures. We see him in our trials. And if we know that the Lord Jesus, the Christ of God, if we know that he is our Savior and the captain of our souls... We have everything and we lack nothing. If you know, and if you imprint this upon your mind, that our Lord Jesus Christ died for you, you are blessed. There is a perfect word for an imperfect time, and you. A disciple of Jesus Christ, you need to know that word. Because when you go through your trials, you may be alone. Oh, you're not alone. Christ is there. And if you are a true disciple, his word is in you. 
in Navy slang, you need to have your sea bag packed with the promises of God. And when you are in trouble, and even when you are not, you need to reach in that bag and you need to pull out a promise of God. You know what my favorite verse is? Romans 8.32. And Tony is here shaking his head. You're shaking your head. But my favorite life verse, and I actually got more than one. He did not spare his own son. But he delivered him up for us all. How will he not with him also freely give us all things? Answer that question. Is God going to put his son on the cross for you and not freely give you? Oh, that word free. You mean I don't have to do anything? No, no. You just have to trust in the faith that's been given to you. Wow. And so we do. How will he not? The one who promised, the one who cannot lie. How will he not freely give us all things with Christ? You see, you who believe in Jesus Christ, you're joint heirs with Christ. That's what Tony was about, was talking about, his inheritance in the saints. You are part of that inheritance, Tony and his family. All of you who believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God are Christ's inheritance. The next question, is he going to lose any of what God has promised him? No. Uh -uh. No, 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 no. I don't care how high your waves are towering. He is not going to lose you. In the accounts of the perfect storm, Matthew, Luke, and Mark, Luke 8.24, Matthew 8.25, and Mark 4.38, the three gospel writers, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, all make reference of that storm when our Lord Jesus Christ took the disciples across that sea to the Gadarenes and the miracle that occurred in that land. We haven't read the passages in Mark 5 and we're not going to, but it is about the miracle that occurred there by the casting out of the demon from the demoniac. Am I pronouncing that right? Yeah, I am. What I'm saying. And it was called Legion. It is an account that the Holy Spirit had Matthew Mark and Luke write. Why? There are small variations in each story, but you've got to remember there just wasn't one disciple on that ship that day. <laughs> you know what? They were all there. They were all terrified. They were all shouting different things at the Lord. It wasn't just one. Uh uh. I want us to think particularly about the things that were said on that boat when these men crossed this sea and that they were brought into that storm that suddenly rose up. Luke chapter 8 and verse 24, the words were spoken by the disciples in the boat were these in Luke. Master, Master, we are perishing. Matthew chapter 8 and verse 25, the words that are spoken there are these, Lord, save us, we perish. A slight difference. In Mark chapter 4, verse 38, the words were spoken, Teacher, do you not care that we are perishing? You know, these words could have came right one after another as all those disciples are crowded around the sleeping Savior in the stern of the boat. Master, Master, we have perished. Lord, save us, we perish. Do you not care that we are perishing? All those words. A slight difference in each one. And we can see in these statements made by the disciples, there was a gradual erosion of faith and confidence in the Lord Jesus Christ or perhaps a different level of faith in each one who shouted different things during the storm on that day. Now, either way, we need to have our attention drawn to the lesson that these words teach us. The Lord is being informed of what is happening in Mark's account 
He's being informed, told what's happening to them. The Lord has come on board the ship. He has gone to sleep. He is in the rear of the boat. He put his head down on a pillow. He is a worry man. And he had gone to sleep. In Luke's account, it sounds like information that is being conveyed. The disciples seem to be realizing that Christ is asleep. And one can imagine the words going between them. How can he sleep through this? Master, Master, we perish. They were informing the Lord of the situation that they were in. They are calling out to him in his sleep. Master, we perish. Matthew's account is a little more insistent. It displays an element of faith. It goes beyond the simple conveying of the message to the Lord that these men are in danger. Here it appears that someone realized he is in the need of help. And there is a certain urgency. Yeah, I bet it's a great urgency that comes from, from the disciple. Or indeed the group of disciples. As the terror, as the peril of their situation begin to dawn on them, there is a call for deliverance in this man's cry. There was a call for salvation. Now we have moved from merely arousing the master to our urgency or crying for his immediate and urgent help. Lords, it wasn't that quiet. Lord, save us. We perish. Save us. Mark's account reveals an altogether different sense. There is a different characteristic to the shout that goes out there. It has a rather dark undertone, doesn't it? It suggests a rebuke of the Lord Jesus Christ. There is a suggestion of indifference by Jesus Christ. Someone on that boat, on that afternoon, shouted something at the Lord Jesus Christ. And though it was a shout of terror of the moment, it revealed a deep-seated doubt, a failure to grasp who the Lord was, and a failure to understand what he was doing. Someone on that boat shouted that afternoon, Lord, we're dying here and you do not seem to care. Now we as believers are not immune to trials or from inward doubt. Faith is something that is living in us and faith is something that should be growing and increasing. And if I were to ask you again, how does faith increase, what would your answer be? Don't be afraid to speak up. What are we told? Faith comes by? Yeah. Right, right, right. Why is that so hard to understand? Now, if faith comes by hearing, what does that require? It requires a steady discipleship. Right? Okay. We must be careful as disciples, not only for ourselves personally, but for those whom we fellowship with. You see, we have responsibility for our brothers and sisters. Well, someone may say, well, isn't that meddling? No. That is a display of the love of Jesus Christ that is in us. We do not want to see a brother or sister walking into trials when they really have no help at their right hand. So we pray for them. We encourage them. And faith can often be weak. It can be small. It can be hard to lay a hold of. And while there are those who perhaps who were in that boat who shout, Master, Master, we perish, wake up. 
You know, tell him we're here. Tell him to look at the difficulty to say to him, Lord, save us or we perish. There are also, and there will be those that I dare say it will be an experience of each of us who are the Lord's people. A time will come when we will say, Lord, don't you care anymore? Have I been mistaken? Have I been wrong in this? Am I dying here? And you don't seem to care? I can't see you. I can't hear you. You are not with me. Where are you? You don't seem to care. In Matthew, it is reported that Christ rebuked them. All of them. Matthew, Mark, and Luke, John. There's a, I do not believe that these are three separate statements. I think Christ said this all, all together. Why are you so afraid? Do, why are you so afraid? Do you still not have faith? Where is your faith? You can. Here is the biggest mistake of Christians. We tend to think as death as the end of everything. That beyond death, I'm afraid we think that there is no hope beyond death. Do you understand that you cannot kill a Christian? You can kill their body, but you cannot kill their soul. Why was it that Christ said, do not be afraid of the one that can kill your body, but be afraid of the one that can cast both your body and soul into hell? That's the one to fear, not the one with the gun. Jesus promised it, didn't he? In John, the 11th chapter, the 25th and 26th verse, he promised. Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. I bet you can finish it. And he who believes in me will live even if he dies. And everyone who lives and believes in me will never what? And then the next question Jesus Christ asks them, ask her, do you believe this? I do. I've been given faith. I know who the captain of my vessel is. And why? Because of grace. I believe because of grace. You see, not even a perfect storm can sink the perfect ship of the perfect Savior. <coughs> Jesus Christ is at the helm of the great ship, the SS Eternal. That's what I christened it. <laughs> if you don't like it, you can christen one it yourself. But there's perfect rest. Christ was tired. His day wasn't over yet. Have you ever had that kind of day? Boy, you're bone tired and you've been working 10 hours, but it is not over yet. And you look in the distance and you don't really see an end to that day. And even when you lay your head on the pillow that night, you're still thinking about that day. Ah, it would be better to pray than to worry about the things of the world. His day was not yet over. It appears to have been late afternoon or evening when they were crossing that sea. The Lord had been teaching all day, teaching in parables. He had been preaching all day. He spoke to large crowds. I'm going to get off on a little sidetrack here. I want to say to you, those of you who don't preach, do not ever underestimate how burdensome and how worrisome and how tiring preaching is. First in its preparation and then in its delivery. There is a physical dimension to teaching as well as a mental and a spiritual 
dimension. And it is a wearying task. It is a consuming task. You need to remember to uphold your pastor if you value him. You should help him. You should uphold him. You should support him. And you remember that he is as engaged for you in the preparation of the word that he wants to deliver to you as you are in your own work and in your own job. And when you come home in the evening at night and you're tired, he also is tired. He has been laboring in the things of God It is tiring, but it is uplifting. Remember this. He is much more responsible for the product of his work than you are. His work has eternal consequences for which he will be held accountable. Let him do it with joy. And if you do, it will be beneficial for you. Do you remember as the Lord broke the bread by the sea and he fed the 5,000, he gave the bread and fish to disciples and they were to distribute it liberally? It is the Lord that gives us spiritual gifts and gives us spiritual understanding that we have, that we possess, he graciously hands it to his disciples. And we are to liberally disperse it among those for whom we come in contact with. The Lord will provide the opportunity. Now, the expounding of the word of God is a principal part of the assembly's worship. And we need to value it. Never think that it's an easy task for the preacher or for the disciple. Or for the disciple, it only comes with great desire to apply yourself to paying attention to the Word of God, to expound it, to know that it is a special blessing that the Lord gives to His people. Imagine the world would you without the Word of God. You would have to have your house surrounded by a moat. You would have to have bars on the windows and guns at every window. Because the, if there is a world without the word of God, we are in chaos. You can see just in the examples around us the chaos that occurs in the people who have not been called to the Son of God. So it is one thing to be taught the truth. It is a totally different thing to experience the truth. There are many who are taught the truth, who never experience it or never avail themselves of the truth. And the biggest lack, I think, and I see this in my own life, and I'm ashamed to say it, the biggest lack that we don't take advantage of is prayer. And I see some of you shaking your head. Yeah. Why not? The throne of mercy is open to all of God's children. And we can draw there with confidence so that we may receive grace to help in a time of need. The last few words that we read in this account was this. What manner of man is this? that the wind and the sea will obey him. Christ had expounded the parables to him. These disciples had sat with him all day. They had heard the parables. He had broken them up. He had given them clear teaching, but they had to have an experience. They had something that needed to happen so that they might grasp who this man was. In John chapter 8, verse 32, we read these words. 
You shall know the truth. And the truth shall what? Amen. Knowing the truth and the liberty and freedom that truth brings us is the experience of knowing that Christ has delivered us and redeemed us. How do you know if you are his disciples? Christ said this. If you want to know if you're his disciple, <laughs> if you continue or remain or abide in my words, then you are my disciples. Discipleship is not a part-time thing. You know, if I get a little vulgar, what you do, those who have been given belief, sometimes you just need to grab yourself by the hind end and march yourself to where the word is open. Okay. John 8, 31, that was what that scripture is quoted from. And anyone can make a confession of faith. And there are many who do. There are many churches around us. And these churches are full of people who have made a confession of faith. But is it only a confession? Or is it indeed a continually learning? Is it continually remaining in his words? Then you are my disciples. The parable of the sower that the Lord had just expounded before they set out across the sea. We know there are wayside hearers, right? They hear the words by the wayside, but just sort of pass on by. And then there are stony ground hearers that sprout up and then they die. And there are those who are lives are full of thorns or care for the world. And the seed will be choked out because of the care for the world. There may be evidence of some extent of interest in the things of God, but the reality is that only in a fraction of the cases is there a fruitfulness that flows from the teaching and the preaching of the Word of God. There are full-time disciples that are here when the Word is opened, and there are part-time hearers. And we know that part-time does not pay very well. There are no benefits. So now we come to the perfect healing. Verse 35, And on that day when evening had come, he said to them, Let us cross over or go over to the other side. Why, why would they do that? There was a demoniac across the water that the Lord Jesus had to heal. There was an elect child of God over there that he had to deliver from the grips of Satan. But there was also a lesson to be learned by the disciples. Christ had a revelation to give them. And he had a miracle to perform for them. The Lord Jesus Christ was tired. You know what? I bet the disciples were tired also. Trials and difficulties do not come to us when we're ready for them. We must pass over to the other side. And in that passing, we will be caught unaware in the throes of a storm. The tempest will rage when we are caught out in the open. The trials come when we are exposed. It is when we are passing over that we are vulnerable. That is when the perfect storm comes. When we do not have a safe harbor in view. In other words, nothing of man will be able to help us. It is then that we are most vulnerable. We have to go through these trials. We have to learn what it is to be in the storm. We need to know our limit. God will not test you beyond it. We have to discover our own heart. We need to look in our sea bag of faith and pull out the word. There's one in Titus. 
in expectation of eternal life was God who cannot lie promised before the time of the ages. My Lord will rescue me. This is another one that comes out of that sea bag. That's a promise. My Lord will rescue me from every evil deed and bring me safely to his heavenly kingdom. That's 2 Timothy 4.18. The Lord Jesus was not caught in that storm by surprise. He was not surprised by the intensity of it. He is the all-knowing, omniscient, almighty God of all eternity. He was not caught by surprise like all the events and circumstances of our life may bring about to us. But everything, now listen carefully, everything that happens serves his purpose. I'll repeat that in case you didn't hear it. Everything that happens occurs for his purpose. Do you believe that? It's the truth. For we know that God causes all things to work together for good to those who love God. And then he has to those who are called according to his purpose. You think you're here for your purpose? <laughs> <laughs> no, you're not here for your purpose. You're not a believer. You have not been given faith for your purpose. It is for God's purpose. Everything that happens in this world serves His purpose. Even the wicked serve His purpose. Even the devil served His purpose, past tense. Every tile, every persecution that comes on the church that comes in the individual believer's life serves his purpose. Do we believe that? You've heard it. Have you experienced it? Yes, I have. When my wife died in the corner of that kitchen that morning, I experienced the waves that surrounded you. When Anne's husband died, she experienced those waves. If anybody here has lost a father and a mother, they have experienced those waves. But the fact is, the death of the body does not end a Christian's life. So let's not look at it that way. I preached a funeral a couple of weeks ago and the man ahead of me said truthful words. Do not stand on my grave and weep for me. I am not there. Mm. Because Jesus Christ is able to make us stand in the presence of God. Blameless. With great joy. Mm. Do you believe that? Well might these disciples have cried, save us. We're doing the exact thing that we should when we go to the Savior and say, Savior, hmm? bad teeth, Master, Master, I'm going to need your help in this situation. Or like the one in Matthew for us to know where the source of our salvation is going to come from. Lord, save me or I perish. True growth happens when troubles confront us. When we have nowhere to turn, the Lord is nearer than you think. Does he care that we perish? Yeah. Is he asleep to all our dangers that threaten us personally, individually at this church? Are our lives of no importance? Is our well-being of no worth? Am I really his? We're concerned about many things. And then we say, Lord, save us. And maybe it doesn't seem that we're finding these answers to these problems right away. Then the demon of doubt creeps in. 
and says, are you really his? When the perfect storm and its winds crash against our vessel, when the winds blow with a coldness and a ferocity, when we are weak, when we are tired, when we are doubting, when we are faithless, do you care, Lord, whether we are saved or not? And then in verse 39 comes the perfect command. I was thinking, our soul waits for the Lord. He is our help and our shield. You know what it says? Our soul waits. But then he got up and he rebuked the wind and he said to the sea, Hush up, be still. The Lord Jesus Christ opened his eyes. He lifted his head from off his pillow. He stood up and with a majestic and authoritative voice, he rebuked the wind. And it is as if he said, you wind, my servant, you wind, you have done enough. Stop. Don't overstep the mark. Don't go too far. You have served your purpose. Now cease. The Lord said to the sea, hush, be still. And then there was perfect calm. You know, there's a miracle right there in itself because when the winds stop blowing on the sea, it takes a while for the waves to subside. And it takes a while for that ship to keep bob from bobbing in the air. But it says there on that sea that day there was a perfect calm. Have you ever experienced a perfect calm? You know, a couple times in my life I have, and it's almost frightening. I have been on a lake, not in a boat, but sitting on the shore early in the morning when the mist is just rising above the surface of the water, and the surface of the water is just glass. There is not a ripple. There is not a thing. You cannot even hear a bird stirring. The leaves are not shaking in the trees, and there is a perfect calm, and we almost get frightened <laughs> that calm. <clears throat> this was a perfect storm, but it was a storm of perfecting. It was no longer required, and it would be taken away. Instant calm quieted the fear of the disciples. Not a life had been lost. Not one man was hurt on that ship. There was some pride in egos that may have been hurt. There were some valuable lessons, though, that were learned. There was a degree of humility that was imposed upon these men, and there was a trust in Christ was reinforced because of the experiences on that ship that day. I do not want Christ to ask me, why are you afraid? Do you still have no faith? Where is your faith? What does the perfect Savior tell us? What does he say? Have you got this scripture in your sea bag? Can you reach down and pull it out? Can you? I will never desert you. I will never forsake you. And though you have not seen him, you love him. And though you do not see him now, you believe in him. And you rejoice with great joy, inexpressible, full of glory, obtaining the outcome of what? The salvation of your souls. It's the faith that was given you. Though you have not seen him, you love him. Though you have not seen him, you will. When you stand in his presence that day, blameless. I have some questions to ask you, and then we will close. Does the Lord Jesus Christ care for his people in their torment? Yes, he does. 
Has he not redeemed us from the course, from the curse of the law? Yes, he has. Has he resented us in the courts of heavens as he stood before his father and he spread his hands and he said, These are my inheritance? Yes, he has. Has he stood personally to represent us as our assurance, as our substitute? Has he taken the debt of sin from us? Yes, he has. These are the lessons that we learn. This is the doctrine or the teaching that we receive. But we have to come into the experience of these things. We have to trust him in our lifetime. We have to trust in the providence of the world and to know that this is the case. <clears throat> did he take our part in the eternal covenant? Yes, he did. Does he now put us in the presence of God as our advocate? Yes, he does. You can go forward into the light and into the confidence which that brings, he himself has said, I will never, ever forsake you. I will never desert you. For I always live to make intercession for you. Lord God, the magnificence of your word that causes our hearts to be still in the storm I pray for blessings upon all the people that have heard this word, Father. And I thank you for your promises, for your assurances. And now as our, we're asking our visitors not, we were not expected to contribute to our offering, but in our last, the members here, as our last worship of the day, and give his offering. And we ask, Lord God, that you would Fill our cupboards, overfilling. Thank you. Amen. You want to lead us in a song, Kathy?